Okay. So after n equals two supersymmetric instanton, <laughs> as Monty Python used to say, now for something completely different. <laughs> We're back to. Uh, we still in flying circles. <laughs> Sorry. We're still in flying circles. <laughs> We're still in flying circles. Oh, yeah. Back, back to experiment. So we are now um, going to hear from Atlas. Simas. Simas. <laughs> <laughs> We're now going to hear. <laughs> We're now going to hear from CMS, <laughs> and uh, we're lucky to have Maria Spiropulu from Caltech and CERN and CMS, who is going to give a series of lectures, three? <coughs> two at least. At least two, greater than two and less than three, less or equal to three lectures on LHC physics, broadly speaking. And um, maybe even something more about the Higgs. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, well, it says that. Focus <laughs> on uh, Susie and Higgs. It means focus points on Susie and maybe focus <laughs> on Higgs. Okay. So this is going to be a lot of fun, Maria. Okay. Uh, maybe I can switch that off. Okay, I want to uh, thank the organizers. Um, your uh, director, your, the, your other director, uh, Eliezer, told me that uh, this is a city of believers and um, what you see in the poster is the string bridge. And in a city of believers, you don't need proof. You commemorate before proof. So 5,000 years later, maybe when people find this bridge, we'll know that this is the temple of, um, let's say, Planckian, esoteric, unreachable, maybe, for an experimentalist, um, physics. Um, I want to thank David also for the very nice introduction. I am at CMS. Um, I worked at CMS since 2004. And before that, I worked at the Tevatron. So um, it's getting better, obviously. Uh, I will talk to you today um, about the LHC and its experiments with um, uh, some um, information or some uh, uh, design issues that are not very much discussed in, um, when we give seminars and lectures <coughs> of the results. And I will inject some of the measurements that are important in order to uh, do uh, what we call searches at the LHC, including the search for the Higgs boson or a Higgs boson or a standard model Higgs boson or a non-standard model Higgs boson. And I'm, I'm referring to that because when at the design of the program, um, Alam, who was here the first day, uh, gave you uh, a, a fantastic lecture on what happened a few days ago at, uh, at CERN when we had both experiments discussing the results of the most updated analysis for the standard model um, Higgs boson. And uh, he gave you the interpretation of the results that maybe we are actually living in a universe that will collapse um, if the Higgs is around where we might be having those um, tantalizing hints from both experiments, one <coughs> more, one less. Uh, however, I want to mention here before I start, and since this is the, this is the trend of the, of the month, 
that when I was a graduate student, I was not taught um, the Higgs as part of the standard model. I was taught the Higgs as a necessary um, ingredient for the standard model to be understood and the necessary ingredient that could have many forms. So the Higgs was not introduced as part of the standard model, it was introduced as a mechanism for electroweak symmetry breaking. And uh, one of the best mechanisms, let's say, for electroweak symmetry breaking, and it was very <coughs> clear made to, um, to uh, ask graduate students then by Sidney Coleman that we actually need a, an electroweak symmetry breaking mechanism because we have the masses of the W and the Z bosons. And the, the, the thing that we talk about that the Higgs gives mass to everything is not entirely um, accurate in that sense. Um, so um, I, I want to say about the standard model something that um, is important also because we were taught in, in, as graduate students also the standard model as uh, the um, supreme quantum field theory um, that incorporates quantum electrodynamics, electroweak, uh, the, 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 the electroweak uh, um, uh, theory, and um, uh, QCD, quantum chromodynamics. And based on these, um, it is a beautiful quantum th field theory that we have over a hundred measurements, experimental measurements at the per mil level, and therefore that's why we called it. They, they, it is presented to us as supreme. It holds experimentally, and so the fact that we do not have yet, uh, quite yet, the electroweak symmetry breaking mechanism for that reason was something that we were taught it was beyond. Um, uh, the the, the uh, standard model. And so the standard, what we call standard, it actually took a lot of effort uh, to measure and um, uh, 40 years of thinking and doing. Um, uh, it has 18 free parameters or so, the standard model, and 31 uh, Nobel Prizes. Um, so it has built a history in, in, in particle physics and in our understanding of particles and their interactions. And uh, um, it, as I said, I was taught the standard model without the Higgs, but also I was taught the standard model without gravity. Okay. It was much later in, in, uh, uh, in the 2000s when we started talking about gravity in a way that had to do something with particle physics when we lowered the scale of gravity and we were, talk and we were talking about extra dimensions and gravitons and so on. Uh, but for gravity, the way I was taught to it, it was a classical theory, uh, it was a general theory of relativity, it held in other scales, and uh, the hint of uh, unification um, and even uh, supersymmetry with gravity in it was mostly a wishful thinking and something that we extrapolate into scales where we cannot reach with experiments. All right, so uh, before I start, um, I have eight, an eight minutes clip um, on the milestones of the LHC. Because, um, uh, how old are you people here uh, on average? <laughs> yes, you. No, how, how, what is your age, really? <laughs> that, that was descriptive, but um, <laughs> let, let's assign a quantity in, in numbers. 25 light years. 25. So, so we will start before the LHC started being designed, thought of, before you people, on average, if I take you as, an, as, a, as an, an index. I don't want to do the statistics here, but before you people, uh, we're going to uh, primary school, let's say. So I will show you this also because, um, because it marks a, an, an adventure in terms of engineering, not only in terms of, 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 of ideas, but in terms of engineering technology and ideas that caused engineering and technology to advance. 
uh, that is unprecedented. So let's take a look at this. So my conclusion, and the conclusion of this, your scientific policy committee, Mr. President, is that the LHC should be the next project for sir. Thank you. This is Helen Smith, who is the director of, of CERN. Over the past 40 years, we've made enormous progress in understanding uh, how nature works, how, how the forces between nature work. And this machine will al allow us to make the next a very major step and forward. He was in charge uh, of the commission of the for, uh, du CERN. <laughs> and um, it was built to, uh, uh, 
to do heavy iron, work on heavy iron conditions. LHC without these dipole magnets um, the protons cannot be held in orbit on the 27 kilometer tunnel when the LHC was uh, approved uh, the technology for this was not demonstrated yet Delphi experiment that lab up there. The temperature is the same as 1.9 Kelvin uh, for uh, the helium to operate, for the liquid helium to operate. This is a cryogenic line that feeds the helium. This is Lynn Evans again now in uh, 2006, 10 years later, 12 years later. The IMAR sitting there with Lynn Evans, uh, the director of the DG. Um, this is MI-18, the facility that you can now even go and look how uh, magnets are being uh, repaired during and, and, uh, after the after the accident. This is the compact new solenoid detector that was built like a Lego on top, unlike the Atlas, and then it was lowered in the cover. It was built with um, 12 slices, the maximum was 4,000 tons. This is outside the Meran side, on the industry side, where the Atlas experiment um, is, and this was the last piece that uh, was uh, uh, a new spectrometer that was installed in 2008. Okay, and, uh, and it stopped on, on September 10th, the story. Uh, this was the inauguration. And the story um, uh, doesn't want to stop. No. But um, it doesn't matter, I will mute it. Um, but the story was that uh, on, on, on September 19th, 
um, after a serendipity of uh, of, uh, uh, of transform big transformer problems in the machine and then CMS lending the machine uh, one transformer and trying to do something faster, etc. What happened was that uh, there was a, a, a faulty interconnect, and when the machine was with uh, something like 9,000 amps, one of these interconnects that was was that was broken. Uh, caused a massive um, uh, blow up of the of the interconnect because um, and, and an evaporation essentially of the beam pipe and uh, the place where the the open was um, uh, because the the, the uh, be, because the, the helium essentially what happened is that at the break of the of the interconnect and the explosion. The helium uh, made uh, two uh, waves after going from liquid to room temperature, made uh, two uh, sort of shock waves going in opposite directions. So we had helium collisions with the first mechanical boundary, and that knocked off um, something like uh, 50 magnets at the end of the boundary. And it, it, uh, it caused about a year delay. Uh, uh, pe people think that this was thought at the time, that this was a disaster, etc. But uh, we uh, were all um, very, very calm in the sense that we were commissioning the machine. You see, when you have this type of project, you don't have a prototype that you can play. And 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 uh, and commission it. So this was uh, this was something that uh, was bound to happen if one doesn't have a full um, detailed simulation of the entire integrated system, because all of the pieces separately had been tested. At any rate, uh, for what I'm going to show you today, the time that. Um, we had, the experiments had, between that accident and when we actually had the collisions, that was an extra year. This is the time that uh, we prepared with billions of cosmic rays in order to calibrate and understand our detectors, let alone finish them also, because there were missing, uh, missing elements in the detectors, and do all the tests that needed such that when we present the results for the Higgs and supersymmetry, you see these amazing systematics and you see a turnaround of data that is unprecedented. At the Tevatron, it took years before we got, after we took the data, before we showed analysis, and now it takes uh, uh, weeks to months. So this time, it did not go in the wind, and I will make that point. Um, of course, with the first collisions and the first results, uh, the first criticism of the LHC was there immediately, that we are the destroyers of all the parallel universes. We did not make the black hole, and all of the things that everybody was anticipating and all the drama did not actually occur. So before the collisions, uh, it was uh, the, 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 the story was that we're going to destroy everything. After the collisions, the complaint came, why didn't we destroy everything? Right. So for, th that, goes on to, that goes on for most, for, for most everything, in fact. Um, now, I want to go and show you a slide from something, uh, which is an interesting, I find, slide for the history of particle physics. When you build a machine, you have a mission why you build it. And the mission can be a convolution of um, a scientific mission together with what you can do, what you can afford, an economic mission, and also a political mission, why you are doing this kind of activity. CERN was created in the 50s as a decision of politi as a political decision together with the scientists in order to, un to unite Europe after a terrible war. So, there is, in the, in the mission of every of these machines that uh, Sam wrote, there was an original purpose and the expert opinion why, for example, the PS was made at CERN, the Brookhaven, the AGS, why Fermilab was built, uh, Slack, um, CERN in, in the 80s, the, the ISR, Petra in Hamburg, uh, the Super Kamiokande, even as recent as 2000, and even the Hubble Space Telescope. And um, in no case, the expert opinion matched uh, what uh, actually was found in this machine. So the temptation right now is for the LHC 
um, to write the expert opinion and uh, also what we think um, it's going to find, to, to, it's going to discover. Um, and and I, I'm going not to put it right away because I think it's early, but it might be the first exception in this table. So um, going to the going through again the history, we talked about the history up to uh, the first collision, up to the actually up to the first light and um, and the failure. And the only intermediate step that I wanted to show you uh, was 1993, that the LHC was actually approved uh, immediately after the SSC was cancelled. And that was not also by chance. And uh, the last three steps um, are the past, uh, essentially, two years and the year that we are entering very soon. So the first extended run was uh, in 2010 and we got 40 inverse picobarn at square root of s equals 7 tv. This is half LHC design. The original design uh, was at uh, actually 14, but the original design was 10 to 18. I will come back to this in the last lecture when I will show you what the lab is planning for the next 20 years. And we're going back to energies that are 30 TV, um, and the R&D is, is starting. So the, the, there, is a long, there is a long way ahead of us. Um, the second extended physics run uh, was still at this energy. And the reason, by the way, the reason that we are not running at 14 TV is because we have to do a survey of, of all these interconnect splices. And um, in, in, in very simple terms, uh, those of you who have taken an undergrad lab, uh, when you solder something, you don't use the same solder to, so to solder something on top of it because the solder below will melt. This is a very simple, uh, and, and if you have a company doing this and a company <coughs> doing that, or two, it, the integration between, or the talking between all this doesn't work, then uh, it's bound that somebody will use the same solder and therefore the low solder will solder and you will, uh, it will melt and you will create an open. And that was a, a, you know, a, a lab 101 problem for anybody who held the solder in their life. Um, but we have to do a survey of all these uh, 10,000 interconnects and figure out if there are any such opens. Obviously, we have run at 7 TV uh, for, um, for, for, for two years now, and uh, one and a half. And uh, not, we, we have had quenches. The quench system works beautifully. There's no, uh, there's no real big uh, issues. But in order to increase in energy and to go to the 14 TV, we really need to be careful. For the year to come, again, I will say in the next lecture, we will get another, perhaps, uh, one TV. And uh, uh, so we, we might run at 8 TV. That means it's uh, 3.5. TV per beam, and I want to remind you your Mandelstam variables and how the S is connected to the center of mass or the center of momentum better um, energy. Um, so um, um, I want also, given the table that I showed you from something, I want to show you what was the mission statement, why CERN made the LHC. It was there at Carlo Rubia slides. And uh, the reason was that it was the right machine for further significant advance in the field of high energy physics research. You see. So, um, and also in 1994, the, this is a decision for a 20 year commitment. So that means that when you have strong will and you say, I will go and do research, you don't have to really promise anything. Of course, when we are going to be looking in, a, in about 10 minutes on how the experiments were designed, it will be pretty obvious how, what they were designed to find. Uh, I will give you some of the machine data, and, this, and I will go a little bit into the machine because we are indebted, indebted to these people. We show results from the experiments, but the machine people have worked, as, as, as ob it's obvious that they have done tremendous um, work. Uh, so it's, uh, it's almost 27 kilometers uh, we saw the superconducting dipole bending magnets, um, uh, 1,232, 15 meters each. 
um, 14 point something meters each, and each one produces um, uh, 8.3 tesla, and you can calculate that, why it needs, why we need 8.3 tesla in order to get the protons around 27 kilometers. Um, and then um, the, they are operated at 1.9 Kelvin. Um, the current at 14 TV is about 15,000 amps. So the 9,000 amps when the accident happened, there was no beam, I repeat, but we were powering the magnets. Um, and, uh, and it was uh, something of the of, of a seven or eight uh, TV. Um, there is uh, uh, 90 tons of liquid helium. It's the I think in the universe, in the known universe, this is the highest concentration of helium. And 1,000 uh, tons of liquid nitrogen. The, the cooling is not happening. There's no, the, there's no, there's no magic that you can go to 1.9 uh, Kelvin. There is staged cooling with nitrogen and helium and very, um, very elaborate technology in order to have the, the valves that can actually uh, do the transfers and do the, the whole, the whole um, um, going down to 1.9 Kelvin. Um, at specification, um, there are 2,800 approximately bunches of protons. Um, at specification, with 10 to the 11 protons each, we have exceeded these specifications. The intensity that we have achieved is higher than this specification. Um, the total energy of the beam, uh, you can calculate it easily, and it's uh, 362 megajoules. It's about um, uh, a detonation of 125 kilograms of TNT. Other people like to make this uh, transformation of energy and say it's uh, uh, 35 kilograms of chocolate or something like that. But um, um, the, 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 the main point of this is that you cannot have accidents. And so uh, we're done with the accident. This is the, the design. We saw it also on the, on the clip. And um, I, I want to point out that there are two LHCs. It's not one. Uh, there is, uh, this is the, the ingenious uh, um, um, twin board design. Um, we saw it also in, in the clip before. And this was proposed by, by John Blewett in, in Brookhaven in 1971. It was not accepted as the design, neither for Isabel, which was cancelled, which would be another collider, another proton collider, but it was cancelled. And it wasn't accepted for the SSC either. The SSC preferred to have two tunnels instead. The LHC adopted this design and, uh, and it has proven to work fantastically. Uh, this is the CERN site. Has, has anybody of you been at CERN? That's good. Did you go to see the experiments or you went on the yeah. theory corridor? Oh, very good. You, you saw the experiments? Yeah, we visited Atlas and Alice. And Alice. And the um, control center. Very good. And some of the smaller experiments on the surface. And some of the smaller experiments on the surface. So you saw the other fixed target and the linear and the linac and so on. Very good. Um, so, um, yes, there are, given, given that you just said that, there are about 70 other experiments that are taking uh, place at CERN. It's not only uh, the LHC. Um, and the four experiments that um, are taking data right now with the, uh, the four major experiments, there are also LHC experiments that we're not measuring, that we're not mentioning here. But we have CMS and Atlas, they're multipurpose, and then we have ALICE for heavy ions and LHCB. And I want to say that. Uh, Alice, um, that was designed initially for heavy ions, was designed with, uh, with ideas that heavy ions were producing infinite number of tracks, but eventually um, uh, CMS and Atlas can do the heavy ion collision program also, because in fact there are not. Uh, the, the, those calculations from 20 years ago um, were, were off by enough so that the major, exp the multipurpose experiments, CMS and Atlas, can compete very well. And I'm not going to say anything about, um, about heavy ion results, despite the fact that a lot of you could be interested due to the ADSCFT work with heavy ions and so on. But I will tell you that the latest results from the latest run of, um, of, uh, of the heavy ion, which finished in November, produced some spectacular results on heavy ion uh, with uh, jet quenching and upsilon disappearance. 
What? There's no tunnel there, despite what the Italian newspapers wrote. <laughs> Um, we can see which way is Grand Sasso. The Grand Sasso is this way. Okay, since you asked. So it goes by the So this is this is the location on the on the map, um, and uh, it it shows here the the old lab experiments, the Delphi, um, Aleph, uh, Opal, and L3, um, and. Um, and here are the places where the collisions are, the, the major places where the, where the optics of the magnets, where you have the, um, not, only, not only you have the dipoles to keep the, to keep the bending of the protons, but you have all these other quadrupoles and octopoles and all what we call the optics in order to make squeezing of the beams and bring them into collision, into the, colli into the collision places, okay? And you see that there. When you see uh, low beta, it means that uh, the, the beam is manipulated um, and squeezed to very, very uh, tiny uh, cross section so that we have a high collision rate. And now I'm going to give you a few slides of collider jargon. So the luminosity, the instantaneous <coughs> luminosity is given by this formula up there. It's a reduced formula. It's not really the, the, um, the, the exact formula, but it's good enough, where you have the number of protons going one way, the number of protons going the other way, the revolution frequency. This is the effective transverse area of the proton beam. Here's where, when you see epsilon and emittance, it goes here. So the better emittance you have is smaller. You have the highest luminosity. Um, and um, this is the number of protons per beam. So the more protons you have per beam, the higher luminosity. Uh, for the design, this was 10 to the 34. We are now very close to 10 to the 34. We are a few 10 to the 33. And uh, the revolution frequency is approximately um, 10 to the 4 hertz, um, calculated by C divided by 27 kilometers approximately. And also uh, the, 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 sigma, the, the sigma B is 16 microns, uh, where the collision is happening. Uh, so that is, the, that is how the beams, so how squeezed the beams are. The cross section. You can calculate it on the back of the envelope by, uh, by using the, 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 the meson exchange, the Yukawa meson exchange and the range. And so it will give you the answer that this plot is giving you, that it is the total inelastic um, uh, cross-section for, uh, for uh, strong interactions is about uh, 60 millibarns. Um, so then we talk about... What is the total? The total diffractive, non-diffractive, 130. So this leaves too much for elastic. It does. It does. And they're doing these <coughs> measurements right now, uh, also in Totem, to come into an agreement on the elastic. There is, there is a bunch of measurements that I'm not going to, ma to mention that are full of rich physics in terms of minimum bias, in terms of the content in minimum bias on, on, on charm and strange. I'm not going to mention there is a lot of things that we need to reconcile, and there will be a lot of measurements and good results out of that. Um, the collision rate is the number of collisions per second and is given by the instantaneous luminosity times this, uh, this cross-section and it's 10 to the 9 hertz. So the input rate to the detectors is a billion per second, okay? So this is the huge thing that we're talking about, uh, there's a billion collisions per second. Now the bunch crossing rate is something different. This is the rate that the proton bunches cross each other at each interaction region. And so if you take that number uh, with a C divided by 27, uh, by, by 27 kilometers, that gives you 310 to the, to the 7. And if you take the ratio of these two numbers, it gives you how many interactions per crossing you have. And that's 20 for this 10 to the 34. Now I will show you I will show you events where we have right now um, 20 pileup events, and that will tell you that those ones that I put in the books um, many years ago we have achieved already before we went to 14 TV. So in terms of intensity of the LHC benchmarks have been achieved, and are the the machine people are planning to surpass them. 
Um, now, uh, there's one more interesting point. Uh, there is uh, every 25 nanoseconds. We're running now at 50 nanoseconds bunch spacing, but the nominal is 25. And next uh, um, February, when we start, we might run at 25, which is the specification. So if we run at 25 nanoseconds, you see the, the, for every crossing, with every 25 nanoseconds later, there is a new uh, interaction. And the particles from the previous one have not gone out of a detector, that it is more than 7.5 meters. And so the readout is integrated over many bunch crossings. And experimentally, this means that uh, this has consequences that I will briefly mention. The integrated luminosity is integrated over time. And uh, it's in units of uh, centimeters minus 2, or um, inverse, what we call inverse femtoburn. Usually, we call uh, for particle colliders a snow mass year, um, the 1 over pi of, uh, of a normal year. The LHC runs a little less than that. Um, but uh, for, one, for one such year, one snow mass year, um, the, the integrated luminosity of the LHC design is 100 inverse uh, femtoburn. So this is to be compared with the total integrated luminosity of the Tevatron after 24 or 25 years of running, which is done, and it's 12 inverse femtoburn. So, and also with the amount of current data that we have, which is 5 inverse femtoburn. Tell me. Yeah, so why do we, why do we always report the, uh, the integrated luminosity instead of the number of collisions, for example? Uh, because of the question that Eliezer asked, that we do not know the exact number of the in elastic plus elastic plus diffractive, uh, and single and double diffractive, and therefore we can give an erroneous answer. We translate it for the press, and we and we say billions of trillions of gazillions Google's collisions, and then go figure it out. <laughs> but in the scalars of the experiment, when you watch, when you have the monitors of the experiment, and for the trigger people, we have these numbers, but we do not translate them into cross section for exactly that reason. So the harvest at 14 TV. Um, for uh, particular processes here, uh, such as a pair of 500 GV jets, QCD, um, um, parton parton, jet jet out, uh, is uh, 10,000. Uh, Susie with one TV is 3,000, uh, so a uh, squark of one TV or gluing of one TV. Uh, a light Higgs would give you 2,500. Uh, heavy Higgs, a thousand, uh, and a three TV Z prime only two. This is the before taking into account what we call acceptances for how, how much do we uh, uh, how much do we detect and also efficiencies and also trigger efficiencies and I will mention a couple of things about the trigger. So now I hope I have convinced you that the raw rate is huge. It's in fact one petabyte per second. And uh, if you compare this to the data that uh, Google is processing, uh, which is 20 petabytes per day, you can see where we are at the LHC. And you can also understand then that we had to develop technologies in order to <coughs> deal with that, because there is not a single one computing site in the world that can store all our data. And, and in fact, it isn't. Um, the answer to this uh, challenge was the, the trigger, the DAQ architecture, and uh, the data acquisition architecture and also the grid. So um, the triggers pipeline the data coming to the to, to coming out of the detector subsystem, to and the pipeline means that you have uh, you have them in a, in a bucket and you keep uh, different parts of the different detectors of the data and you gain a little bit of time so that you process and then you decide very quickly whether you keep an event or whether you whether you filter an event in or whether you filter an event out. So there are enough layers of triggers to reduce this original 40 megahertz event rate down to 500 hertz. We actually can keep even more, and it's a matter of uh, computing requirements, storage space, and CPU at the trigger level on how much we keep. Now, a good trigger is a fast trigger that keeps interesting events, and also it is reprogrammable, so if we see a Higgs at 124 uh, GeV with photons, we can lower the photon threshold and change the triggers of the photon and increase something else in order to be able to uh, have a bigger trigger efficiency. Events that don't pass the trigger, we bye-bye. Um, the trigger system here is shown uh, diagrammatically. This is for CMS. It's a hardware level. Uh, that connects to the front end of the detectors, and then it's it's a software level. Yes. Um, are there any assumptions you make? I mean, obviously, or how, 
physics or model-based assumptions that you make? Yes. Yes, the assumptions that we make is that we need to keep all the standard model physics that we need to calibrate all the backgrounds to all the interesting physics that we'll keep. So e everything, everything really um, um, has um, 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 a, a significant background of QCD. You cannot keep all the QCD because the cross-section is very high. So you prescale and you keep the high PT QCD. Then you divide your bandwidth f with electrons muons, composite triggers, a muon plus an electron plus B jet, and you do it so that you have a target. You keep B, phys you keep B tagged events that is top background. You keep uh, uh, double B tagged events that could be Susie. You keep uh, diphotons, uh, lopity diphotons that could be background to Higgs and also Higgs. Um, and so that's how you design the, the full bandwidth, how we share it. Yes, yes and yes. Excuse me? Can you modify the Yes, we are calling every trigger, every trigger um, month, we, call, we have a new train of triggers that are being, um, that are being um, installed and deployed online. And we do them by having them as backups on the previous one because we know that the machine will change conditions. We will have higher instantaneous luminosity. We will not be able to have the same trigger that we had uh, uh, three weeks ago now. And so we do that all the time without compromising the physics. And we have trigger turn on efficiency curves that we are um, monitoring online um, such that we are sure that we're not missing something. Difficult triggers are triggers of, um, of uh, signals like um, uh, stopped particles uh, and, and heavy, heavy, heavy uh, stable charged particles and stopped gluinos and things that the, that, uh, that are quite, we have to recognize them from the rest of the event because our trigger has to be extremely fast. You had, and then you. Uh, well, I guess it's similar to this question, but I was going to say, how do you know you're not missing something? Because we have the Pandora box, which is a monitoring trigger that we keep events without filtering. And on a statistical basis, we look this, uh, this uh, stream in order to see if we miss something, in order to see weird events. So we sample from the events that we, uh, they have been decided to be thrown. And we keep uh, something like um, 10 or 15% of the, of the bandwidth on this. And we look at, this, at these events. And we find, usually from these events, problems or very interesting events and then accordingly there is a feedback on redoing something about the trigger. We are not 100% sure but we are counting on the fact that uh, there is um, enough luminosity, enough data that a process that, is, uh, that has a, a, fine, a finite, even small cross-section, we are going to be able to figure it out. This, and the thing that picks up is We have neural networks in order then to categorize them. But in order to pick them, we pick them randomly of stuff that we reject. We have um, something that is called music. We have, uh, we have a neural network of events that, uh, that, um, uh, that could be potentially interesting with very weird combinations. And this go in that packet also. But we do monitor all that. The, the reprogrammable is the hardware level, where we will reprogram it at the level one. We will reprogram the FPGA, and this does not happen every month. And that one, the, 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 the deployment at the online, when I'm talking online, I mean the high level trigger, which is the software trigger. This is, this is, the FPGA is the field programmable gate arrays, and there's a lot of engineering going there with, uh, with, uh, with logic in order to be able to do that. Okay. Um, and the other answer to the, to the challenge is, of course, the grid and, um, and a tiered data system where you uh, 
or you, institution, your institution or you with your laptop can access, one second, let me finish my sentence, can access the data directly from the previous tier, the tier two, where it's already sent in different streams, the muons, the electrons, the taus, the QCD, etc., cetera, and, and run your jobs there and give the command there to run your jobs, which, uh, which run and give you back your result into your institution or your um, computer. This, this is a, a very beautiful, sophisticated system, hierarchical in a sense. Now it becomes more chaotic. So all of these, start, all of these tiers start communicating. And even you have tier two to tier two connections and tier one to, to, to tier three connections. So that if I am in my institution, I can access the data that uh, CMS just uh, received. You had a question. Oh, yeah, it was the same question. So, uh, I mean, at the hardware level, I thought that it was already when you, when you designed it, you have a pipeline which has some finite length. So, we have only some finite number of bits. bits. But we can change the logic of the, of, we can change the logic of this, we can change the timing of when we, when we are going to strobe on an event or not. And we can do that in, in some cases if we have pile up in the previous and the next interaction and there is uh, different kinds of noise sources, we can do that. But this is not something you want to do every day, indeed. Um, okay, so the impact of the detector design uh, basically is that everybody has to have a fast response between 20 and 50 nanoseconds. The pipeline can keep up to 10 of that, so it can keep up to 210. The segmentation is fine, so that you don't confuse a photon from a Higgs with an overlapping uh, um, QCD event or minimum bias event. And then also we have to be resistant to radiation. And radiation is going to be important again for this Higgs to gamma gamma that we have seen, um, how the transparency is changing of the crystals of the electromagnetic color emitter. Um, so uh, the impact on the on the event co on the event content is that um, as we saw that we have an event that can consist of 20 different interactions, and uh, most of them are what we call the minimum bias. So these are the low momentum particles in the final state, and they involve uh, non-perturbative QCD. And to understand them, we have to model them with the data itself. Um, the minimum bias, when we say it's soft, it's soft, but, but the uh, typical event will contain a TV or more of this soft energy from minimum bias. And uh, if you compare that to the most uh, energetic heart scattering from the Tevatron, that was 1.5. So we refer to as pileup in the different uh, presentations of our results, the integrated minimum bias interactions over many bunch crossings. Uh, this was also a slide that uh, Elam showed you the first day of a data event from CMS. And uh, now this says it's a Z to mu mu. How do we know it's a Z to mu mu? Can somebody see where is the, what is the Z to mu mu? Where is the Z? It says Z to mu mu with 20 vertices. I guess you can see the 20 vertices, but where is the Z to mu mu? There is, the, there is this thing, all of it, and all these vertices. And there is one vertex with two yellow lines. And those two yellow lines are two muon candidates that hit the tracker and the muon, um, and the muon uh, chambers. And if we make the invariant mass of those two is 91, there's a good chance that this is a zitum mu mu. But it's not a Monte Carlo zitum mu mu, you see. So the way the slide is written is a little. You, and, and every time that you see people sh showing you something, an event, a real data event, the real data event, when they show you one, you don't know what it is. Right? You infer there is a candidate for this or that, but you don't, it, nobody can show you the Higgs <coughs> event. And if they do, tell them, unless it's Monte Carlo, it can, we don't know. Um, so uh, this is a simulation uh, here of a SUSE event um, that, um, um, that uh, was done with 10 to the 34 pileup. So 10 to the 34 um, um, instantaneous luminosity, and that's 20 interactions per crossing. And this is uh, the actual event characteristic after the cascades of the squarks and the gluinos. You've got a bunch of muons. You got a lot of missing energy from the from from the neutralinos, and uh, you've got some jets. Uh, this is how it looks um, before before you do the reconstruction. So you see the main characteristics are here, here, here. The jet 
and the new one. This is before you put the pile up and this is after you put the pile up. Uh, and we have ways now with the data to merge events from the Monte Carlo Higgs, let's say, signal with real pile up events. Um, so, uh, and, and here I'm going to show you the step by step. This is the, the simulated the, at the G and 4 level, at the interaction of the particle with the detector level, how this event, how this event looks like. Um, you have all of this is from the from your Monte Carlo calculator from the from Suzy going through CMS. Then you put the pile up. Then you do your reconstruction, and then after you make the suppression of the stuff that they don't pass your thresholds, you see your uh, your reconstructed event, and it looks very much like the event it went into CMS. So you are able to. This is why you see all these very very clean events despite the fact that you've got all this pile up. So it's a manageable uh, nuisance. Now, some of the lessons of building the detectors and where we are now are the following. In terms of the physics and engineering challenges, the construction of LHC, Atlas, and CMS, it sets a precedence, I said it. The R&D phase was complex and it was impossible to plan. And most of the milestones changed and most of the, miss of the deadlines were missed. Uh, what, what is possible and what is possible also changed during the time of the project. For example, in 1987, it was thought that it was impossible to have all these detectors the way they were built. They thought that they would have iron behind uh, uh, as a muon spectrometer and, uh, and iron in front of it. And uh, that was the only thing that was guaranteed to survive, uh, to survive ra radiation. But in fact, you see that it wasn't. And, 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 um, and in fact, things are... Yes. Uh, point number two, uh, you were complaining that all the deadlines were missed. No, it's not a complaint, it's a statement. It was... So, but it was a lesson. So, so it was a lesson, and so it was a lesson question, not to use it uh, in order to miss deadlines. So, so my question is, so when you have such a big project, was it still useful to have those deadlines? Absolutely, absolutely. Deadlines uh, are, were, and are extremely important. But when deadlines were missed, it was understood always why they were missed. The, 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 the main point of, the, of this fact is that it is such a huge project that uh, if you try to, um, to clock it uh, exactly, it's very difficult to get it <coughs> run. So there is a flexibility. All, there is a flexibility, and there is some. We, we lived with with all these different stages, uh, and 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 succeeded by what you have seen. We succeeded, and we succeeded very fast. Um, so I'm not going to describe the term because I showed you on a um, on a, on a graph. Uh, this I'm going to show you, however, a few slides on how the detectors look like. Um, this is the compact muon solenoid, and we are very bad at acronyms, so this is not a solenoid made of compact muons or something like that. Um, it is compact because it is uh, smaller, basically, than Atlas. Um, it's, uh, the, we use the, the word muon because it detects muon very, muons very well, and solenoid because the magnet technology, the, magnet, the kind of magnet we have is a solenoidal magnet. Um, surrounding it, there is uh, pixels very close to the beamline, tracker, electromagnetic calorimeter, hadronic calorimeter, part of the hadronic calorimeter here, hadron calorimeter, I should say, the solenoid, the solenoid magnet, then outside there is a little more hadron calorimeter, and then everything else is muons. Muons go all the way out, muon chambers. And it, it, is, it, it is 12 different pieces, so the middle part, is the part that is the central part, and then the forward parts are, are um, on the bouchons, on the, on the, the leads. Um, Atlas is uh, much bigger. I will show you the dimensions. Um, it has a toroidal, uh, these are the toroids of the a toroidal magnet design, and the rest of it, in terms of the layers, are the, similar with different technologies, and this will come as a homework. Um, now, the weight, uh, the diameter length, magnetic field for tracking, um, solid angle coverage, and cost is given here. The cost, I think, is rounded. I think CMS costed a little more because, um, because uh, the, the, they charged us 
when, when there was more tax in Russia for the factories that were making our, our crystals, they charged us something like um, a factor of three more. And so we had a, f a full federal event there. But in, in any case, the, 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 the total is about that. So you see that Atlas um, weighs less than CMS, and it's much bigger than CMS. Now, um, the detector concept is that the, the, the detectors are designed so that you keep all of the energetic or most of the energetic particles, and you have to keep them over all the, the solid angles, even um, to what we call pseudo rapidities, eta up to five, where eta is uh, the log tan theta two, and the theta is the polar angle um, um, in, the, in, the, in, a, in a cylindrical coordinate system. There are, um, there are, so the detector is a cylindrical onion, and a good question is why we don't, um, why we don't make spherical <coughs> detectors? Maybe, maybe you can think about that. Um, now, the, 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 what I described to you is the, the general design of a multipurpose experiment, how you go from the inside to the outside, pixels, tracking, um, calorimetry, and muons. And this has to do with how the high energy particles interact with matter, the different high energy particles, namely electrons, muons, photons, hadrons, um, and that's what we measure in order to discern everything. Um, so the question is then, why ATLAS and CMS are so differently designed? Anyone? What's the main difference? What does it mean for us? So the main difference is, The main differences are, of course, the dimensions. And every, of course, every detector is different. But let, let's take the dimensions, why one is so much bigger than the other. Uh, magnetic field different. Um, in, in the end, the results that Elam showed you for, um, for the Higgs uh, were, were comparable, right? Resolutions, <coughs> efficiencies, etc. They were all comparable. Well, yes. Isn't the main reason the same reason that we have two eyes? <laughs> well, that, that's deep. <laughs> that's deep. I, I will think about that. But it, 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 the fact that we have two of them is because we, you want to reproduce the Higgs. Because if only Guido comes here telling you there is a Higgs, and Fabiola is not is not there, then you will say Guido. We need somebody else also. So that's some, that's that's it. This is for the confirmation. That's right. In order to be independent as possible, in order to be as independent as possible, so you have the same phenomena is happening in two places. You have different technologies in in the two places, and eventually, sooner or later, they will have to observe the same uh, phenomena. I say sooner or later because one might be a little bit less in efficiency for something, one might be a little more in efficiency on something. But sooner or later, when you collect enough data and you have a five sigma, what Elam explained to you, five sigma, so you have a, a, a big peak above the background in one, and the other might have four, but then it's very convincing. Or one has six and one has five, and then you stop discovering, you go and do characterization. And then the different kinds of the detector can have a different way of doing the characterization, as independent as possible. Um, well, in that sense, maybe the most important thing I think is probably what you cannot do with grand sensors. As you have two different experiments, you can discard that what you get are systematics. Systematics, there are different systematics. Very good. Two different independent, different systematics. But so we build two of them for these reasons. And why we build them that way, what, what drove building them that way was one, so we're going to go step by step into, into having two collaborations who are competing. They are, and if you are competing, you don't want to get a toy that is the same as the competitors. You want to do your own. So that was, that, that's also a part. But what, what does it, the, the reproducibility, the, the different systematics, etc. But then the, the physics question becomes, um, well, if uh, uh, the, 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 main, the main design characteristic 
um, a requirement of both experiments was to um, measure momenta of up, this is wrong here, of up to, I gave it to my students and I missed the up, of up to one TV muons with no worse than 10% accuracy. Okay, that is the, the requirement. I, the, the slides are on the first, so you, you can find them and you can find the, the homework um, and you can solve it. I will, the answer is, is that uh, eventually you can say that the detectors are dual and you can say that you could make two different ones with, two different, with different technologies and different uh, sizes and measure the same thing as long as, the mom, as long as the muon is no worse, the accuracy of the muon is no worse than 10%. Um, the beautiful events that, uh, that, uh, that uh, David saw with the four muons, the four muon beautiful events for um, Higgs um, is going to, to, to give out the physics region, of course. Um, now, um, so uh, all in all, the magnet, the magnet system um, is giving you a total BL square, which is very similar for the two experiments. Um, Atlas, other than the toroidal magnet, it has also solenoidal magnet. And uh, so the, the, mag the toroidal magnet is, in is for the tracking only. Uh, so you can, you can look and solve it. It's a BL square problem. It's a simple problem. But this one requirement then is, uh, um, is driving all the rest of the design. CMS chose to have a four, T, a four Tesla magnet, very strong magnet, and then it had to figure out how many um, interaction lengths you have in, uh, in order to get electrons and photons in this particular space within this particular um, solenoid. And so they had, to, they had to find a material that nobody ever used in, in, in hadron colliders before, and it is the lead tank state calorimeter with these crystals that costed so much from Russia. Um, and China, <laughs> secondly. Um, then um, um, all of the rest uh, of, of the design, all of the rest of the design characteristics are determined. So here it is. The, the, this is another one of which you cannot make a prototype in the table and, and test it. So when we brought that up, uh, uh, our hearts were stopped in order to see what was going to, to happen. It's, a, it's, a, it's the highest um, stored energy uh, uh, magnet in the uh, man-made magnet in, in, in on Earth, uh, and and that's because you have in medical physics magnets that are very very high uh, magnetic field, but they don't have a, a, an inner diameter that you, you can put a hammer, and so that makes it a very a very uh, impressive. Um, so, so the, the benchmark question is why, and is why the, the detectors were built like that, and it was because to find the Higgs, the, the Higgs, the Higgs that goes to two Zs, that goes each to two muons, at any, uh, at, a large, uh, at a large mass range, or any such kind of thing that will go to two Zs, that will go to four muons. This is why the design characteristic was that, and this design characteristic morphed the two detectors in a different way. So this is, I think, something uh, good to know. And then you see that from the first run of, 20, uh, of May, May 2011, one of, the, one of the runs there that uh, um, uh, had this uh, fantastical um, uh, four um, muon candidate, that, uh, that, was, that circled around as the first Higgs um, um, uh, boson, I think. Um, so this is uh, one such clean uh, candidate event. And, and uh, um, the, the muon systems of both detectors are, are working very good. So high energy problems on how particles interact at high energy, we have them, we solve them. The high luminosity, we have it, it's a challenge. We solved it in 2012, it will be bigger. Uh, the high data rates we solve, uh, so all these challenges are addressed. Um, we, when we started, we were in the big, uh, in the big uh, sort of uh, media as uh, as uh, as unprecedented scientific achievement. Um, and since we're talking about unprecedented scientific achievement, other than the fact that 
the, uh, we, sh we discussed this and we calculated at design specifications, we calculated that the stored beam energy of the LHC is 362 megajoules and within the first uh, month of collisions in uh, 2010 at 7 TV, um, we had achieved already bypassing every other collider ever before in beam energy. But the thing that I want to show you, um, and this is for a 14 TV LHC, is the probe power. Why can we find um, things that, uh, particles that uh, are in a very, very large range um, of masses? It's because the, the square root of S hat of the partonic process um, compared, for example, to the Tevatron that dies off here at um, close to 1.52 TV um, is much, much higher. And, I, and here is uh, what, we, what we show as partonic luminosities at Tevatron and uh, the LHC. Now, the LHC at 7 TV, um, this is the LHC at 14, so each one 7. So the current LHC is here. So our current limits in particles that they are heavy particles that they are produced at threshold, when we reach the end of this curve, it means that we have to increase the energy in order to go and look for heavier and heavier particles. But you can do with the LHC the scanning of all these masses, and then you can go and do more precise measurements if you want in a linear collider at that particular mass. Um, I will skip this. Um, I, I want to show you uh, just a snapshot of each detector uh, f for CMS, um, but similar and as impressive is the design for Atlas. The silicon tracker um, com comprises of a pixels, pixel layers inside and thir <coughs> 13 uh, um, um, uh, wafers, layers of, uh, of silicon wafers that total about 220 square meters of silicon. Um, it's 80 million readout channels. Uh, it is the world's uh, largest solid state sensing device and it is the smallest major element of, of CMS. It reconstructs up to 500 separate charged particles per collision and it's measuring, it has a resolution for the vertexing that it is in the micron level as you would require in order to see all these uh, 20 vertices, for example, from the pileup. This is the, the, the this is the electromagnetic calorimeter, the crystals of the electromagnetic calorimeter. The killer app is to find the Higgs boson into two photons that you heard a lot about. It is very dense to capture the energy, but transparent for the readout. And it comprises about 75, actually, thousand lead tank state crystals. Here it shows you this uh, famous resolution plot. Um, and the resolution is very important when you're trying to understand um, whether you found the Higgs to gamma gamma and whether you can, uh, how, how the resolution changes impacts very much on what you can say about the exclusion or the discovery. Um, so for, for the first time in Hadron collisions at, uh, at CMS, we calibrated this, uh, this uh, calorimeter with uh, pi zeros, um, with pions. And uh, this is within a few hours of the, of the LHC, of the first LHC runs, where we have the, with a, with a 900 GV data, where you have the pi on peak. Then you see as you go to square root of 7 TV, the background changes, but still you get a very nice peak. And with this, you do intercalibration of all the crystals. Now you have, th this is what the standard model means for us. We go from the pi zero to the Z peak, you know that the Z-Peak has a width, which is 2.5 GV. You, you fit it with the data. You do, the, you do QCD, QED corrections. You fit the width with a bright Wigner and some resolution function. And the resolution function compared to what you have in the pi zeros, what you have in the Z, is going to give you some knowledge about what you expect for, 120, for 124 GV, for example, Higgs. And this is very important measurements, and the precision is very important um, here. Um, um, this is uh, the history of this plot. So we monitor this at all the times. The calibration is happening at all the times. Why the calibration is happening at all the times? Because there is radiation. And with radiation, 
the response of the calorimeter, specifically here, the crystals, is changing. Why is changing? The transparency is changing, and so the light we gather is changing. So you need to have, other than the standard model candles, the Pi Zero, the Z, you need to have also constant monitoring with laser, and we do that. This is the, the constant monitoring with, pi, with pions and etas. And then you have the laser ones, and here is something very important. This is, um, this is the, the scale, the E over P scale, the electron measured from the calorimeter, uh, the momentum measured for an electron with the tracker. This is um, the, for the, the, the day as we monitor it. And so this is the scale of V over P as we get higher and higher luminosity. And this is after we correct it, we, because we shoot laser all the time, after we collect, correct it for transparency losses with the, with the laser um, monitoring system. So you see that it is flat at one, which is what you want in order to be able to say that you've got your, uh, that you understand very well your calibration. And you see the effects of all these, um, of all these um, uh, um, transparency losses and change of the, of the resolution uh, if you look at the peak of the Z. So the Z comes back to bootstrap on what you've done in the calibration with the Pi Zero at the 90 GV and see if your calibrations are coming out right on, the, on, on, on that candle also. So this is important. Uh, uh, this is important experimental aspects of how that enter in every um, analysis. Uh, well, it, it, it tells you, it gives you an indication of when the hadron damage could be such that the, the yellowing will, will be in. in um, this, we don't have to worry for the next run, but when we reach the 300 inverse femtoburn, uh, we shall have to, to, to see that and only for the end cups. But for the end caps already, we need, uh, we need to understand the, 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 uh, our resolution better. Okay? Yes? No, it comes back. Every time we have, yes, this is what I was going to continue in the sentence for that. Yes, it doesn't come, it, it, um, the transparency of the crystals until you damage them in ways that we don't know what the damage is, and there are such ways. Um, be, because this has not been, uh, the, the, we have test beams, but we haven't gone all, to the, all the way to all the radiation of all the types of particles that you see in collisions, right? So uh, there is a recovery. Every run, when we stop, then there is a recovery and the transparency is coming up. The, the physics of that is the holes and the and the centers, the color centers in the in the in the crystals. It's a it's an annealing that it bring it comes back and it. Uh, uh, no, it's even it's even less. Uh, it's even less. Well, we yes, we we monitor that also. So you can see that it goes up and then it goes down. So if we do periods by periods, you will see that the response is changing. Um, so this was the status um, of. Uh, the, the thing is, is that it's, um, we, we do have um, more than one a day a week uh, uh, stop working of the machine. So they do have, they do take time, uh, uh, enough time per week. And then we have enough uh, of, of recovery that we can discern what exactly is happening. But um, I, 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 I must say that at least for these crystals, the, the, the material, the, the solid state level radiation studies that we have done are exhaustive, but not in, in, in a condition of collisions. So we are seeing things that we have not uh, perhaps expected to see exactly like that. And, and people are working on that in order to figure out what we are going to do for the, for the 14 TV and even what we call the high luminosity era, because there will be an era of high luminosity and an era of high energy, even higher than 14 TV, and we have to figure out. Maybe it's good to put um, um, a calorimeter, and since you have the tracker up to 2.1, and maybe you can extend the tracker and do a hybrid calorimeter with absorber that, it, with that you have both silicon and scintillation and absorber, and, and do something a little bit more, more modern, let's say, but, but combining all this. Uh, uh, um, okay, so this was the only sighting of the Higgs at CMS uh, as, of, uh, as of a few months ago at least, um, when, uh, when Peter Higgs appeared there. Um, this is the, the CMS, this is not photoshopped, he's really him, and he really came to CMS. Um, 
And, um, and uh, these were the results up to lepton photon. So um, you, we, you have seen from, uh, from ALAM, and I'm going to show you also the results of the eight updated channels from uh, CMS in the next lecture. But the, the status of affairs from the electroweak measurements um, as combined um, in November 2011 gave a little slither here uh, of allowed region for the Higgs mass. And um, this was the excluded region uh, for in MTOP versus MW. And so uh, the, the, where, where the Higgs is, is cornered really, the standard model Higgs is cornered really um, much at this point. Um, now, uh, for the, 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 the ingredients, I'm going to point out the ingredients and I'm going to give you the result um, on the next uh, lecture. But the ingredients for the, for the low mass Higgs search, where the Higgs to gamma gamma, as you remember from what Elam showed you, uh, has a considerable branching ratio, um, is that um, you have to have a very good resolution on the invariant mass of the two photons. The challenges are vertexing with pileup. We have beaten that challenge. We have done it. It's good. We are good for the moment. Um, calibrations and transparency corrections for the crystal. I showed you we've done it. And then the way the analysis is done is um, uh, such that we divide in four categories depending on the mass resolution. And so we have the better categories and the less good categories. They're all good, but we have the better and the less good categories. And then you got a background that it is a smooth background from the major uh, from the major from the major background it's a smoothly mod it's a smooth function model background here it's a it's a fifth order polynomial um, to to um, to model the the irreducible QCD which is very large so you measure that from the side bands and there goes a lot of detail on how you're going to do this analysis why the function is smooth why is it an exponential or a polynomial atlas did an exponential cms did a polynomial all of this is a it, it takes a lot a lot of of um, uh, different kinds of of, of uh, uh, tests to um, to to do um, but the signature is, of course, very clear. It's two energetic isolated uh, photons, and, uh, and you're looking for a narrow peak. So this is the, this is the plot. Um, some people would kill, I heard, themselves, <laughs> um, say, m making the statement that this is the 124 standard model Higgs. Um, we will discuss it next time a little bit on, on how you discern this thing. But this is the data. Uh, and again, uh, Elam explained to you very well that in a high resolution like this one, um, search, um, the, the, the story of the look elsewhere effect is how you do si signal background uh, subtraction and how you do the modeling and how you get the result uh, an exclusion or, 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 or a discovery is a tricky game, okay? So it can be looking at here, do you see Higgs here? I mean, who sees Higgs? <laughs> see, that, that's what I thought also. Uh, but it, it's not a matter of seeing it, however. That's the point that I want to make. And, and uh, Elam made this point that you don't see it, you don't really see it until you have the five sigma. If I had a five sigma there, I would be able to see it. If you don't have a five sigma, and, and I would do the background subtraction, let's say. But if I don't have a, a, a big enough signal, then the, what we call 2.4 or 3, five minutes, oh, oh. Um, so um, so this, this, uh, this uh, is the, the result from CMS, and we're going to discuss how this translates in a limit. But I want to tell you that it, the, the, I hope I convinced you that the ingredients that go in order to understand this um, distribution and get a, an excess out of this is highly non-trivial and we have all the handles uh, in terms of the experimental details in order to be able to make the final claim that we made that this there is an excess of, uh, uh, of 2.4 sigma, okay? Um, so uh, that, is the, that is an event 
that uh, you may say um, that that is in this around this. It's a clean diphoton event that uh, is a Higgs candidate. Okay, and you see the pile up, and you see the very clean photons in uh, in uh, in red. Um, so this is the other calorimeter that um, actually is made uh, of uh, brass and steel from Russian bullets. <laughs> I mean, we, CMS has a very big Russian uh, collaboration. collaboration. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even joking. This is from the cartridges of, of bullets um, uh, to capture the energy and plastic scintillator for it out. The killer app for this is to discover Suzy or dark matter uh, or, and understand all the backgrounds with jets. A hadron calorimeter is trying to, together with the electromagnetic calorimeter, is trying to figure out uh, jets. And at the LHC, everything is produced plus jets. There is nothing that goes it alone. There is always plus hadronic um, energy. Um, this is the muon system on the outside. These are um, the. Uh, 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 it is. It is. Uh, uh, very far away because only muons penetrate that far and there are different technologies. We have wire chambers and cathode strip chambers and so on. Um, so this, this uh, slide is showing you that for all of the phys what we call physics objects can be high level physics objects that are electrons, as I said, electrons, photons, uh, jets, um, the missing energy which is the imbalance, but then we've got taus, Bees, and, and these we apply a reconstruction technique or a tagging technique. For bees, because they are long lived, we tag them with the secondary vertexing, for example, or a lepton inside the jet. And for a tau, we take the reconstructed visible mass in order to say that this is a tau. Um, in any case, for all the particles that we say, we see we have uh, performances that we can demonstrate are um, uh, supreme for one year of running. I mean, at the Tevatron, this took years and years. And I want to show you, before I close, I think I'm going to close here, but before I close, I want to show you all the processes we have measured with 1.7 inverse femtobarn. This is the almost the entire electroweak. Um, and QCD because you have W plus jets, Z plus jets, um, W gamma, Z gamma, all the dibosons took 20 years for the, for the Tevatron to discover the last dibosons and uh, um, maybe um, a, a, and going now into the, into the, in the with the 1.7 uh, uh, inverse femtoburn uh, we are with the, the, the searches <coughs> for the Higgs in the different channels are becoming um, are becoming very uh, intense, as you have seen already. Um, so I will stop here, and on the next uh, lecture, um, let me just. Uh, this is this is all the standard model physics. I'm not going to show you this except for a couple of calculations that are, are important for PDFs and for how uh, you can be useful by making calculations for the LHC. In fact, uh, in fact, this is something that you can ask Tvi and his collaborators because the, 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 the calculations that we need for the LHC are um, QCD calculations and on next to next to next to leading order because we see now up to 8, 9, 10 jets and the calculations for these processes, uh, the full calculations for these processes are what they are developing. So they are putting a lot of work in order for us to be able to uh, not throw the baby with the water. Um, but after I, after I show you a little bit of that, I'm not going to show you all of that, but I'm going to show you a little bit of that. And what I want to insist on, <laughs> yes. Um, right, I want to insist on a couple of things. Uh, these are the stakes. I will talk about Susie and Higgs results. I will, I will show you these calculations abbreviated, but you can find them in, in the lecture notes. But I, I'm giving you these calculations because LHC physics is QCD physics. And if we don't know QCD eventually, to do the next step, let's say we found the Higgs, whatever else we're going to do if we found the Higgs, can we say the CP? Can we say the spin? Can we say if it goes to tau tau, etc.? Whatever we're going to do in order to do characterization, we need QCD. And so, 
calculations of that sort are extremely very important. Uh, but what I wanted to say about, uh, uh, about Suzy um, and the Higgs results that you have seen is that um, if there is a standard mo model like Higgs in the masses that we say we have these this hints, these tantalizing hints, <laughs> This is okay for um, the MSSM with heavy squarks. If there is a standard model like Higgs with uh, 130 to 150, uh, that could be okay still for SUSY with non-minimal Higgs sector. If the standard model Higgs is excluded over the entire mass range, that could be also okay with SUSY with non-standard model Higgs-like sector. If there's no Higgs, but there is something else, then Suzy can be still at higher scales. So the, 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 the rumors that Suzy has a problem with, uh, with, uh, with, the, with our Higgs or, or et cetera, this, these are not, or with what we exclude, this is not the case. Um, so, so here, this is a, a Suzy friendly uh, area that we are at, at the moment. And um, other than that, uh, we cannot say much yet, and there will be a long, long, uh, a long, long program. So, on the next lecture, what I will show you is on Suzy searches: what are the new methods, uh, <coughs> and why methods that were used um, ten years ago in calculations for Suzy, in order to characterize Suzy, are used now in order to discover Suzy. Okay. Um, that is the famous transverse masses and uh, uh, edges and doing uh, twists and flips with uh, Lorenza transformations in order to get to the, to, the, to the heart of the new physics process and not just do what we did at the Tevatron, for example. So I will show you some of these methods. And, and I will show you the results of the exclusions. But what I want you to pay attention to is what we do not exclude and what we have not yet looked for. And that's vast. And then on the Higgs searches, I will show you the brief summary of the channels from CMS, a la what Elam uh, showed you uh, for Atlas and a little bit of CMS. But also, I will show you what is ahead. If it is there, do I need to think of making a new, um, a new uh, particle flow detector in order to determine couplings? Do I need, what do I need to think in order to be able to do something already with the LHC? Not wait for the next linear collider, but already because as maybe the, the first list that I showed you, maybe this is the first exception of actually finding what we were looking for or similar, but maybe we have a chance to actually do precision uh, physics in a Hadron Collider. And that will be an awesome adventure that extends 30 years from now. Thank you. worries me in talks that I see, and that was when I saw the New York Times. I think it is great that, that experiments appear in the New York Times, CNN, BBC. It's great. Yes. But when we bring New York Times and BBC back into our scientific talks, and I've seen it now too many times, that's not so good. So, so I would ask you to consider, and many of the spokesmen, which come, to consider to leave this I take the message happily back. <laughs> I will take the message happily back. <laughs> I will. Yes. I have a question about the, the resolution of the, of the crystals for the... Yes, yes. Um, so it, it was, it was a, a big thing around the one point. That was the Higgs simulation, and that was the resolution of the diphoton invariant mass. Right. Yes. But uh, Elam said he thinks that the, the Higgs is more like yeah. 125. So it, is the, but the resolution already there was, was, was much smaller. Yeah. Will it still be OK if, if the Higgs is 125? Yes, it will still be OK if the Higgs is, uh, is, uh, is 125. It will still be OK. And as the Higgs gets a higher mass, it has also a different width, you see. OK? So the resolution um, is extremely important at the lower masses, and it gets not so important at the higher masses. 
Yes. What do you know about the UFOs, young man? <laughs> good. Oh, very good. You were Sami. That's good. Um, so they, they, they are doing well. They are doing well. We are understanding things very well. The UFOs are understood. Uh, there is a little bit of the scraping issue for 25 nanoseconds. But the beams are doing really, really great. Better than, better than we want them to do in terms of intensity. Because if you ask me personally, I don't want 70 pile-up events. Yes.